Hi everyone, welcome to the Italian C++ conference 2020. With Alessandro Vergani, the conference co-organizer, we would like to thank you for joining our first online only C++ event. Hi Alessandro, can you hear me well? Hello everybody. Hope you enjoy the conference and uh, have a nice day. Thanks. Okay, so let me give you a, a bit of information about about the event, like we do in the in the welcome message usually. So first of all, as you know, uh, when the when this emergency started, a lot of people, uh, including event organizers, started thinking about what to do with uh, already planned events. And uh, we were part of this uh, we of this group, and uh, you probably know this uh, this post by Bryce on Reddit. It's a good idea to gather together all the C++ events affected by the coronavirus. And uh, uh, this post uh, is uh, from uh, the middle of March, and uh, actually we postponed the decision to uh, turn into an online event only this conference uh, at the at the beginning of April. So we tried to stay positive at the beginning. We probably didn't understand the situation really well, but at the end, instead of canceling the event, we decided to try to adapt to these new rules of the game that I hope will be temporary. But we made this decision to uh, try to give uh, an online experience to all the people who follow the Italian C++ community. And we try. We are trying to keep alive the dialogue about C++ that we opened seven years ago. Uh, I would like to to share this experience um, as soon as possible. I mean, I would like to share all the errors we made and also the decisions we we take we took. Uh, we all other organizers. But before I publish a blog post about this, if you want to reach out feel free to uh, send me an email at marco at italiancpp.org. Because, you know, we were one of the latest events taking this decision. But at the same time, we are the very first major and recurrent C++ conference going online. After us, C++ Russia, C++ on the sea, and all the others. And I, I would really like to give my uh, and our experience with this conference to all the organizers of tomorrow. So. Uh, in the meantime, I'm publishing this blog post. Please feel free to send me an email to ask any, any questions. Mm, obviously, you have some clear advantages of uh, turning events like this online because you can reach a wider audience. And uh, we, at the moment, uh, we, we still don't know how many check-ins we have, but we had yesterday uh, a total number of more than five, 500 people registered. This is a huge amount of people for us. As you can see from the latest two editions, we are 200 people more than usual. Uh, we still don't know the drop rate because it's quite hard to estimate the drop rate for online events because we, we will have people from uh, watching the conference that have, that have not actually registered. So we still don't know how many people are really uh, joining the conference. But we anyway sent a check-in form, as you know, and by checking in, you know you have the access to the lobby page with the information to join the, the networking, and you have all the video recorded in preview and all the links to the uh, live sessions. Now the live sessions are public for everyone, so I would like to welcome also all the people watching the conference without being registered to the event itself. I would like to thank uh, someone in particular. First of all, I would like to thank the University of uh, Roma 3 because we were supposed to be there and uh, uh, everything was was done. But at the end, you know, the emergency came out and uh, we hope to be there next year. I actually don't know, but I think nobody knows really what happens next year. That's my hope to be there in, uh, in 2021. I would like to thank the sponsors. So I've uh, ThinkCell and uh, Le Hexagon Leica because they stayed with us this, in spite of this decision to stay uh, to, to go online. So many thanks to the sponsors. 
And uh, last but not least, I would like to thank all the speakers. And I'm very happy that going online, we were able to reach speakers like Connor or Walter from all from the other side of the of the world for us. So another clear advantage of going online is obviously reaching people that probably you, you cannot reach otherwise. So many thanks to all the speakers. Some of them already recorded their sessions. All the others uh, are speaking today. Very happy to, to host them. Uh, stay until the end. Apart from the classical closing message, we'll have a raffle of four Nostarch Press coupons of uh, $20. So to, to buy books. Stay until the end, we'll do a funny raffle, you know, with some C++ code running. Okay, let me um, let me fill this remaining time uh, with a bit of information about this event. Such information can be useful to both uh, attendees and uh, organizers. Okay, so how it's made, which, which decisions we, we, we took. Let me let me speak about that. Okay, first of all, the live sessions. Live sessions, at the very beginning, we, we were thinking about using uh, OBS, so streaming the session on our machines by calling the speaker, so each speaker uh, via Skype or Hangout or any other platform. <clears throat> These choices were actually not so reliable. And thanks also to Phil Nash that we involved in the discussion, Alessandro and I decided to uh, opt for StreamYard. StreamYard is this platform we are using now for streaming. And the clear advantage is that, first of all, it's very easy to use. You just send a link to the, to the speakers and they can join the studio here. And uh, also is reliable because it's going on you know, is hosting everything on the on, on their server on the cloud. Uh, so if I lose the connection at this point, Alessandro will will be there. Okay. So while Nico will be speaking, for example, after me, um, if I lose my connection, if I lose my uh, electricity for some reason, I don't know. Uh, uh, Nico will be will be there and, and and will be speaking. No, with no problems. So that's uh that's the first combination. Just one note. We only have YouTube, but if you are, if you have more resources, you can point to uh, multiple destinations. We bought uh, two pro licenses to uh, overcome all the limits on the streaming, but we only use YouTube because we cannot manage other channels at the moment. But if you have other other channels like Twitch or Vimeo, I think it's a, it's a good idea to exploit all such channels. Uh, just two tips for you. If you are watching the, the, the session now, and I see that you are dropping some comments in the chat, so thanks and welcome. Um, if you want to ask some questions during the talk, please add the prefix question at front of your message. We'll be very uh, gentle from you because uh, uh, we would like to moderate this chat and it will be very easy for us if you, if you distinguish the question this way, so thanks. Another thing, Towards the end of the session, we'll drop a message into the chat and also a banner uh, that I show you in a, in a, in a second, uh, like this one. Okay, this is just an example. Don't do it now because it's uh, for the end of the of Nico's talk. Um, to give feedback, so please give feedback. It's just a survey with a couple of questions, very very quick to to fill, but it's very important for us and especially for the speakers. So this is important for us. Um, how we manage the recorded session, obviously we went to YouTube and all the speakers uh, recorded their session on their own. And uh, another option that we gave them was to arrange a time slot suitable for, for both of us and to use the, using the same setup. So using StreamYard, YouTube, you can pre-record the session into a private link, and that's it. So you you can have both the options, you know, leaving the speaker what whatever they want, or mm, arrange a time slot and record the session with uh, with them. Okay. Okay. Now the most, in, in my opinion, the most critical part, because in my opinion, an, a conference like this is not just a bunch of live talks. Okay. There are human beings behind. 
and it's very important to give them a, a networking experience. We did some tests and uh, also, you know, we spoke about, I spoke a lot with people and uh, try to understand which was the most suitable setup for us. At the end, we opted for Discord. Uh, and this solution is only reserved to uh, attendees. I mean, who actually took a ticket? Obviously, a ticket was free, you know, but we tried to uh, limit this option just for people registered. So at the moment, we have some people already on the on the server and all of them received the, the link via email yesterday. So let me give you a bit of information about how this uh, experience can work, at least what we imagined, because you are probably better than us, but we imagined this thing. First of all, the tip number zero, you know, C++, so zero-based indexing. Uh, first of all, be professional. We, have, we still have a code of conduct, obviously, and uh, I think this event, like all the other events we organize, is, uh, let's say, learning safari. I borrowed this uh, little manifesto from a book, and uh, I, I loved uh, the four points here, the four bullets here. Uh, please be professional, be polite. This, this is a professional conference and uh, the behavior you have, it's, uh, it's very important. Since uh, this is not an offline event, we cannot really know who is behind the screen. So the way we can uh, handle accidents can be also kick you out of the server. If you, you, know, if you assume some behaviors that are not fitting the code of conduct. So I think, in my opinion, it's just a matter of being professional. If you are professional, if you are inclusive, every, everything will go, will go very well. So please be professional. Let's enjoy the conference all together. Let's have fun. Uh, the first tip I, can, I, I feel to give you is uh, introduce yourself when you join the channel. You can do it in the, in the general channel. An example is, hi there, this is Marco Arena from Italy. Someone, someone is already well, uh, introducing him, uh, himself or herself in the channel. So this is a good, uh, this is a good starting point, I think. Uh, a suggestion for all of you, a recommendation in particular is to wear some headphones like these one, earphones, microphone, in order to reduce noise when you speak uh, in the voice channels. It's important, especially for other people that are watching the video or that are uh, attending the, the room with you. Because if you create some echoes or some crackling noise, can, can be not really good for them. So please do it. Uh, we have both some text channels and uh, some voice channels. You know, this, this event was planned to be in Rome, so we tried to be fancy and we used uh, some uh, Roman landmarks and neighborhoods to name the rooms. So the English rooms are recognizable because apart from the icon with the speaker at front, also because the name of the room is uh, a, a Roman landmark, you know, like Colosseum. So you can ask, you can, you can tell to the, to the people, hey, let's meet at the Colosseum. So it seems, seems nice. In the, the, the Italian rooms, are named after Roman neighborhoods. So in, in um, you know, uh, like for example, Garbatella is a, famous, is a popular neighborhood in Rome. It's not so far from where I'm streaming now. It's uh, a couple of kilometers. Sponsors, we have sponsors in, the, in a category called sponsors. You can imagine this is like the sponsors area in the, in the real conference. And uh, they have both text and voice channels. Please meet them. They are going to present something. They, they are going to interact with you, with you. I think this is a very interesting opportunity for you and for them. We have communities. Actually, we only have include CPP. This is my fault because I haven't advertised this possibility so much. So I'm, I really apologize for this, uh, but in general, it's very, in my opinion, it's very uh, good to have to host communities on board of your 
of your server, if you're going to use Discord, I mean, please include other communities. I, I think it's very important. It's, it's, like, uh, it's like giving them a virtual boot. So in my opinion, it's very important. In this conference, we only have inclusive people. That it's amazing, in my opinion. So please go and meet them. Just uh, an information for you, if you don't know Discord, how to join a room, how to step in and out of rooms. Easy, you just click on it. It's easy, but sometimes you, you don't understand. So let me explain. You just click the voice or the text channel. When you click the voice channel, you are automatically displayed under the voice channel. This is extremely useful because you can see the list of people connected. In my opinion, this makes perfect sense because when you are in an offline event, sometimes you sneak into a room, have a look at the people and check if there is someone you want to speak with because sometimes you have a list of people you want to meet. It's like a mission sometime going to a conference. This is perfectly fine. So in this way, you can see who is connected to a certain voice room. And if you are interested in speaking with, uh, with someone in particular, it can make sense to have a look at the list of people connected. In my opinion, it's very, very important also to meet people you don't know. So please go there and speak also with people that you don't know, that you can learn more value. If you want to disconnect from a room, uh, on the bottom left of the screen on Discord, you have this um, small panel uh, with the connection information. There is a, an icon, this one, with a telephone and a cross on top of it. Click on it, uh, you will be disconnected for all the voice channels. So actually from the voice channel you are connected to. Okay, very easy, but I want to mention this because sometimes people ask how to join, how to step in and how to step out the room. Makes perfect sense if you don't know Discord. Okay, the worst missing feature in my opinion of Discord is the raise hand button. We don't have a raise hand button. I can, I can do this, I can't do this if I am not uh, turning on my camera. So we try to create an idiom, let's say the mute and mute idiom. Um, this can be used if you have a, a moderator that faci who facilitates the discussion and you can ask uh, someone from our staff uh, to do it. So what's the idea? When you join a room, mute yourself by default. You, you have to mute yourself. Everyone can, say, can see that you are muted. When you want to speak, when you want to participate in the conversation, unmute yourself. If someone is moderating the discussion, uh, this person will see that you are unmuted and should give you uh, should give your turn. Okay, let's try using it. Ask the staff if you need particular moderation. I'll get in a in a second how to reach uh, the staff. You can reach the staff in a few ways. The mm, easiest probably is to go into the support channel in the whole category, and you can write there. That's the, probably the, the easiest thing. Another way is from any other text channel, you can mention the staff. Mentioning the staff means that all this, the staff members uh, will get notified. Uh, this can be useful in particular if you want to be reached out privately. You can say, staff, please, can you get back to me privately? That's, that's an idea. Another way, not especially recommended, is um, reaching a staff member directly in a private message. Why is not recommended? Because I don't know if the, the staff member can be busy and uh, maybe is not able, she's not able to reply. Okay, you can see uh, the st all the staff members connected when you click any text channel on the top right of the screen. It's a list of roles and you have staff with all the people connected. At the moment, for example, I am connected like a staff member, but probably if you text me, I cannot reply because I'm streaming this presentation. So. 
two ways to reach the, the support, the support channel, or mention the staff role directly in any text channel. I'm very close to the end, so stay with me for a few minutes again, for a few minutes. We have a channel for jobs. Um, this uh, idea came out from uh, testing the server. Uh, one of the staff members raised this point saying, hey, why don't we, we have a, a channel for posting uh, job offers or job opportunities? So we have it. This is not uh, really, let's say, uh, checked by us. I mean, uh, all the job postings there are not really verified by us. It's a free channel. Please don't spam. The policy is still the same of the other channels. I borrowed a, a great idea from Meeting C++ and from Jens Weller. Uh, I didn't know about this joblint.org website where you can check your job postings. So my advice is this one. You create your job post, you paste the text into this job link and you check if the job, if the job is compliant to a certain number of rules, including, you know, uh, not being, uh, um, uh, don't use sex words or uh, not use racism word or stuff like that. So it, the, 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 the job, Posting should be as much inclusive as possible. And with this tool, you can verify that you are new, you are not using some words or some sentences that are not compliant. In my opinion is a great idea. So uh, that's a, that's a, a suggestion. And this link is also in the job uh, channel, in the jobs channel it, itself. So give it a try. Very close to the end, uh, an, an extra recommendation, give feedback at the end of, the, of each talk, but also if you have a ticket, if you have a free ticket, uh, in a few days, you'll get a, an email um, with a survey, more a bit more uh, extensive survey, uh, with a few questions more about the event and how we can improve it and uh, what was okay, what was not. Please be uh, as much detailed as possible. It's very important, not only for us, but also, you know, for the other organizers, because we would like, I repeat, we would like to share our experience, our errors with all the other people. So this feedback is not only for us, but it also is also for the other people. Okay, I think that's it. At this time, you usually uh, I ask the people to, well, I don't have to ask, but usually people give a big round of applause. So give a big round of applause uh, virtually, let's say. Enjoy the conference. I'm very happy that you have joined this, uh, our first online only event. I'm very happy also as a C++ organizer with Alessandro uh, to be the first one going uh, online. So hope uh, that everything will go, will go well, that you enjoy the conference. And I also would like to wish good luck. I'll do it at the end as well. I want to wish good luck to all the speakers, but especially also to all the organizers of the future events that will be online. So. I think now the time has come. We are five minutes, but I think we can, Let me just we can the... start. Yes, Ale, please. Uh... Please tweet about the event, uh, post on uh, Facebook, on uh, any other social media you use, so we can reach even more people if they haven't heard of uh, the conference before that, then can join now yeah. and enjoy the rest of it. Yeah, thanks, Ale, good, uh, good tip. Uh, all the videos, uh, the live videos are now public on our YouTube channel. So even if you are not registered for the conference, you can you can uh, share the videos and uh, you can watch it. So please do it. So I think now the time has come. I think I can welcome uh, Nico Yosut is on stage. Let me add him to the stream. So welcome, Nico. Welcome to 
Welcome to the Italian C++ uh, Conference 2020. Thanks for accepting our invitation. Buongiorno, everybody. <laughs> Buongiorno. <laughs> That's uh, all I know uh, <laughs> about, the, uh, about Italian and uh, Italian language, maybe. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a pity that I'm not in Rome right now, because that was the plan. Um, on the other hand, I'm, I'm happy to speak. And one reason is, um, I should say that, that I had um, COVID-19 already. So, and it's, it's, not, it's not a fake and it's real. You in Italy know that, but um, in the world, there is some crazy movement around uh, people don't want to see something they don't um, ex have experience about. So yes, it's, it's not fun. I can tell you that. Um, so, but now let's concentrate on C++. And when I was asked about um, what to talk about, um, um, I thought about that, that I talk about, I would, I would like to talk about move semantics. And you might say, well, wait a minute, this keynote should tell us something new. Um, but there's an issue with move semantics. A lot of things are not well known about this. It's a little bit like with templates, even after using templates for 20 or 30 years, um, you still learn. I mean, that's a common scheme in C++ at all. You never know the whole language. And um, even those who standardize it, and I do it for 30 years now, almost for 30 years. And um, so let's um, talk about move semantics. And one background reason is I recently wrote a book about it. Um, is, is, my, is my screen online uh, already? It's oh. now, yeah. yeah. We it's saw now. Nico, we step, out, yeah, we step out of the street. And if you want to take questions, just let us know, and uh, we'll step in again and yeah. uh, we'll give you support for reading questions. So good yeah. luck you, and you thanks. Can thanks. Jump in all the time. There's also yes. another way to ask questions during this talk, just only. There's a Slido. I have set up a Slido channel, and the interesting thing with that is, um, as you see here on the left, um, people can ask a question and they can vote on it because as we have several people around, maybe that um, you have some urgent question you share with others. Uh, I can't answer all the questions, of course, but if there are urgent questions where 10, 20, 50 people want to know something about, that's a way you can use. Just look at slider.com, check in for Let's Move, and raise your question or vote on other questions. And I can then, at the end, say, yes, this question is done. OK, so let's Great. see how it works. Um, a few things about me. As I said, I, I'm doing C++ for almost 30 years now. And I was in the center committee for um, more than 25 years now, or close to 25 years now, uh, starting with the German committee um, earlier than 97. So to some extent, it's all my fault. And um, But uh, we are at this time 200 people standardizing C++. So it's not a chief architecture behind, it's a committee driven thing. And that means that sometimes we go in different direction, directions, have different opinions. And um, when some people claim about something, I always say it's your fault because you haven't been there to make it better or to make it different. So um, that's the thing I can give you back when this is a community-driven thing. And as you see, my job um, over all these years was to explain the things we standardized there. It started um, with the first book, started also 25 years ago. And the latest book is about move semantics. So you, you might not be surprised when I tell you, I learned a lot about move semantics when I wrote this book, which is almost done. It already has 200 pages. And this is the essence. And this talk is the essence about what I learned and what is most surprising about it. I will not explain move semantic in all the details, but I will tell you why it's important, why you should care, and where you have to be careful about. So 
the agenda we have is we will write code. Yes, we will implement. And um, now you might ask, oh, that's 90 minutes to implement something. That might be a very interesting class we implement or algorithms or so. No, no. We will just implement and test a class called email representing an email address, and we will care about good performance. That's all. It will be a very, very simple class. Ready to go? OK, so I will add the slider in case you have questions. I will create an um, open uh, a file um, saying, uh, let's implement the class email here. Um, sorry, I'm an old guy. I use VI or Vim, the editor. And uh, I have a couple of compilers here so we can try it out. So <clears throat> class email, um, we need the, uh, the preprocessor guards around, or some includes, and here we have the class email. What should the class email represent? An email address. So it's probably good to have a string as a value, um, just as a private member. And of course, we need a way to initialize this value. So let's create a customer taking a const string by reference and initializing the value. Um, I use the old way to initialize a value. Maybe maybe I start with modern C++ and use here curly braces for initialization. I personally prefer initialization by curly braces. That's what I teach now because it's um, more consistent and usually more self-explanatory, but not always. Nothing is always self-explanatory in C++. OK. Um, then let's um, implement a getter. And yeah, just ask for the value. And let's implement an output operator. Um, so this class should look pretty forward for you. No surprises. That's probably something you learn in your first class about C++. Um, let's test it. Here's my test I want to write and discuss with you, which is um, I have a main function um, which takes um, from the command line a, a value for the number of elements I have. Um, if I pass something, otherwise I take a 100,000 um, as the initial value of number of elements. So we want to create a test with 100,000 email addresses. And how do we test them? Well, the easiest way and the common way, let's use a vector and a vector of email addresses and um, iterate and fill this vector with different email addresses we create with a helper function called new email. Um, you see on line 15, we call new email and push the result back to the vector. So here's a function new email I want to implement. You see I've prepared a few things, but um, could also easily write this up. So new email um, just creates an email called user with an ID and then at mydomain.com. And um, you uh, have the idea is incremented each time we call this um, function. So we got user1 at mydomain.com, user2 at mydomain.com, etc. And let's, at the end, um, sort the elements in the vector. So let's call a sort function. And the sort function um, goes from begin to the end takes the email addresses and sort them by get value. So you see my email address has, does not have a less than operator. So I need a lambda to sort the email addresses. And um, yeah, let's use the value. So let's use my function get value to sort them. Um, there's also one thing I should explain, which is a timer here. It's a helper class using the chrono library. And then this helper class, we can just measure how long it takes from one checkpoint to the next one. So um, this will check how long it takes to initialize the elements in the vector. And this checkpoint will check 
how long it, took, it takes to sort the elements. Okay, I still think it's pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, feel free to ask some questions. Yes, we can improve some things, I know, and we can discuss something. That's why we are here. We will concentrate on move semantic issues later on, but let's just compile this class and see whether it works. So let me save the current versions. I've prepared a make file for it. So let's open here. Um, yeah, I tested already some things. So I have here um, um, a command line. Uh, this is a Unix environment under Windows. So um, this is using a Sigwin. I have a couple of compilers installed, uh, different versions of GCC, also Windows. So let's compile this with um, GCC. Um, a couple of things that are important because we measure the time. You should never measure without doing some optimization because optimization changes everything. So let's see what we have here. Um, we have here um, GCC 5.3, uh, we have minus 0.2. Um, so this is um, the typical commercial optimization level. Some projects use minus 0.3, but in general, this is good optimization. And a couple of warnings are enabled. So let's use pedantic C++ and let's uh, print a lot of warnings about things uh, that can happen. Um, you might know these settings if you are using GCC um, already. Um, I could um, successfully compile this code. So let's run. So, what we can see here is um, the two times, the, the, the two durations that are of interest for us. Uh, how long does it take to initialize a vector of 100,000 email addresses? And how long does it take to sort them? And um, 100 milliseconds to initialize, and um, one dot five, roughly 1.5 seconds to sort them. Um, let's run this again, because um, yeah, time changes uh, when you measure. And I have not implemented a loop that I do a couple of measurements and, and compute the mean value. Um, anyway, um, you see that the numbers are pretty stable around, um, say, 100 milliseconds for initialization and one dot 1,500 milliseconds, so 1.5 seconds for the sorting. So let's write it down somewhere. I think I have prepared a notepad, something like that here. So the basic C++ 11 version, initialization, 100 milliseconds. And um, for the um, sorting, 1,500 milliseconds, because we want to compare these numbers later with some other versions. So the first question here is, um, is this already better than before C++11? Is there something used we could um, benefit from? And the answer is yes. The reason is um, we have compiled with the C++11 compiler, and that means we have compiled this with C++ move semantics. So with support for C++ move semantics. And that support is available already for strings, which we are using, and vectors, which we are using. Um, so can we test how big the benefit is from using move semantics here? Yes, there's an easy way to do that. Well, we could go back with an old compiler, but there's another easy way to do that so that we have the same compiler, but just move semantics disabled, we can say, um, let's provide a special member function. Because when we provide a special member function, such as um, a destructor or copy constructor or assignment operator, then by default, move semantics is disabled for classes. 
if you don't have implemented any special member functions, then your class will benefit from move semantics. So let me just finally implement an, uh, a constructor doing nothing special. So with default, a uh, destructor with the default behavior, and let's recompile. And run. So you see, well, 150 milliseconds, 140 milliseconds, and 1,900 milliseconds. Let's do it again and again. Yeah, something like that. So it's um, if you measure it, the the point is, do we see significant? Differences, and I think we see some significant differences. So we see something like 150 milliseconds for initializations, that's or more. That's significant more, and we see maybe something like 1,800 milliseconds for the sorting with move semantics disabled. So we benefit already from move semantics somewhere here, um, despite that. If you have a destructor in your types, some optimizations are not that ideal than before. Um, but I can tell you, I had implemented this with an old GCC um, version with an old compiler to double check, and we get roughly the same numbers here. So it seems just by recompiling this code, um, if it's already uh, conformed to C or 3 with the C 11 compiler, you save some performance, a little bit. Well, one third for initialization. And um, when we saw it, we also had saved something. And the reason is that these classes automatically um, use move semantics. I will show you an example. So I switched a few times to slides to explain you some differences. And I show you some something you should be aware of. So if I have here, as you see here, a class like customer having two strings now, we have only one string and maybe another ID. And we take a const string reference for both the first name and the last name, and then initialize our members. So initialize, so how expensive is it to add a new member to a vector? So we might, um, here on, in this case, we create the vector, the, the new element on the fly. So in the, in the yellow box here, we say, let's create a customer, which our helper function new email does for us. But um, so let's assume we have it. And because we have some string literals, um, passed to the constructor, we first have to convert these string literals to, to strings. And then um, we can say, OK, um, for these two strings, um, let's um, copy them to create the new object, the customer. So um, this unfortunately allocates um, or might allocate memory a couple of times. The first allocation is because we allocate memory for the first name. And then we copy this first name, F, into the new member first, as you see here. And then the same happens for the last name. Um, but the good news is that here, move semantic is then used. Then we have a temporarily created object and this temporarily created object uses move semantics automatically because the temporary for, for your um, classes, your um, classes have a predefined move constructor unless you have special member functions and they just move the members if move semantics can be used. So we create a temporary customer and we move this customer into the vector this is a temporary object. We are about to die. We no longer need this object. So we will use 
the move constructor inside the vector to pass the value of this customer into the location of the first element in the vector. And that means we will move away the first name and the last name. And that's something you save with uh, move semantics. Um, at the end, we will destroy these um, objects. By the way, um, some people ask, is it, um, isn't it worthless if we use and play spec? No, and play spec is a different optimization. Um, yes, you will. You might save this copying, but move semantic in Excel also um, can help if you use and play spec. Not in this example, but we will come to an example soon. Okay, let's go back. So let's go back to our to what we to our measurements. So this is our program, and this is our output. So we have seen here that we have here an email address that uses benefits from move semantic already because we create here on the right, we create a temporary email address return. And this temporary email address is moved into the vector. And also what we will see later, the vector will internally, when it grows, realloc, use reallocation, which will use some move semantics also. So that's also a reason why initialization becomes faster. OK. Now, this, a surprising thing might be, why is sorting not faster? Because um, look at this. Um, we sort all the elements. And sorting could benefit from move semantics a lot. In fact, it will use move semantics internally, but um, and, and with using move semantics, um, instead of copying all the elements all the time around when they when we swap them and, and swap locations of these elements in the vector, um, it seems that we have some improvement, but not a real improvement with uh, move semantic support. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is this implementation of get value. Get value is, um, is returning a value, uh, giving the value of a member, and it returns this value by value. So we don't re return by reference here. And it's a pretty common question in the C++ community, should get us return by value or should get us return by constant reference? And uh, here's the answer to that question. And you might be surprised by the answer. So if we return by value, we are safe, but we might be slow because that means when somebody asks for the value of an email address, they create a copy of this email address and give it back to us. So each time we compare two email addresses here on the right side, we create two copies of strings. And please note, intentionally, these strings have significant length so that um, at least on some platforms, the short string optimization can't be used. So there's really memory allocation involved when these strings are copied. So it seems that get value being that expensive doesn't uh, give us a lot of benefit that our sort now switches from copy semantics to move semantics. However, you might say, well, yes, you're an idiot. Everybody knows if you have a string member, return it by reference. So let's do that. Um, and recompile. And run. Ooh. That's a difference. Please note here 
that now the sorting only takes less than 300 milliseconds. Oh, sometimes more. So it seems that um, having a getter returning a member Um, having a getter, sorry, I just got a message here by email that my 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 system will reboot. I hope that's not true. <laughs> okay, um, if I'm aware, I will come back in a moment. Um, good. So let's compare this new function. Let's um, let's use um, getters. By reference, and let's see the new numbers are um, well. We have uh, ah, I should disable the destructor again, so I should switch to the real C plus plus eleven version. Let's recompile because. Yeah, and now we are even better. Oh yes, see that. Um, we have, um, again, 100 milliseconds for initialization, but um, for sorting, we have, uh, well, about a tenth of the time we need to sort the element, a tenth, a factor of 10 better. So you might say, yeah, yes, let's always return getters by reference. That's approved. Wait a minute, and you will see in a moment why this is something we talk about in the talk about move semantics. Let me do the following. Let me implement a, for, an, a range based for loop iterating over all the characters of a new email address. So, Let's with by character iterate over what we get as a new email, new email, and then call get name, uh, get value, sorry. So that way we got the value of the email address, that's a string, and let's iterate over this string as we see it here. So maybe we just print out the values. Um, character by character. So I print out a character, and then I print out a space. And at the end, I print out a new line. OK. Some of you might know this problem, the problem I have now already. And uh, so let's run this and see whether we have a problem or what the problem is, because there is one. Oh, looks good. So where's the problem? Well, well maybe we compile this with the Windows compiler. Oh, where's the output of the characters? Where is it? Maybe I do something inside. Maybe I'll to x equals new email. Oh, no, just email um, initialized with um, just a long email address. Oh, it should be an email address. So I don't know. Nico.sutis at, I don't know, gmail.com, something like that.
So let's run this again. Here we again have a problem. Let's implement this with a GCC compiler and compile this with a GCC compiler. Looks good. Well, what I try to create here is that you can see that, oh no, look, doesn't look good. Look at this. Can you see that? It starts with a capital U. Well, my email, and, and, and that's not the value of the new email address I got here. It looks like this is a value of X here. So what is the problem? What did happen here? And how can we fix that? So let me talk about slides again. So um, we do something like here on the right side. We loop over the characters of a temporary object, which we access with a op with a member function returning accessing it by reference. And this at best is a call dump because you have programmed here undefined behavior. So the problem is the range based follow. The range based follow is defined the following way. It says the thing on the right of the colon is first used to initialize a reference. Here it is a universal reference, but it doesn't matter really. So just some reference is initialized with the thing on the right. And why do we have that? Because we have to use the thing on the right twice. In the range based follow, we have to call begin for it and end for it, both. So to access something twice, we first need a name without creating a copy. And that's what a reference can do. And um, fortunately, references extend the lifetime of where they refer to. So if it's a temporary object, they extend the lifetime of a temporary object. But in this case, what we refer to is the return value of get last which is a reference. And um, so we extend the lifetime of the return value of the getter, but we don't extend the lifetime of this temporary created here. So what we have here is the following situation. When we start with the loop inside the range based for loop, we have a reference, to what was returned as a getter, to, so as a reference, to an object that was destroyed. So we iterate over a destroyed object. And that creates undefined behavior. Sometimes it might work, sometimes not. And that what you could see in this example. So having here a getter returning data by const reference means that we have here um, it, a problem in this kind of code. So we create a temporary object here. Then we access this by reference. And when the range based for loop starts to iterate, this temporary object is gone. And we iterate over the value, in this case, of an object that is no longer there. And that creates undefined behavior. So sometimes you might see nothing. Sometimes you might get a call dump. Sometimes you might see different values as you see it here. So if you don't want to have this behavior, the rule is, and that's especially a rule for safety critical environments, your getter should always return by value. End of discussion. Well, wait a minute. Performance is important. So can we do something better? Yes, we can. We have move semantics now. And we can do the following. We can say, well, OK. In general, I have one implementation that returns by value. <coughs> <coughs> I 
But let's also provide another implementation that returns by reference. And now there comes a trick. The one returned by value is for temporary objects. How do you declare temporary objects? How do you um, specify that you want to use them? Well, if you pass them by a parameter, you can use two ampersand because two ampersand means um, that's an object you no longer need the value from. So you can do this also when you declare a member function. You can use this as a reference qualifier. You can qualify your getter to apply only in cases where you have temporary objects or objects with moved. So this is the implementation for unnamed temps and, uh, and, and objects marked with moved. And um, then we need another implementation here. It also has to be reference qualified, so you can't use const here. So you have to use const reference, um, the others. For all the others, we take this. So what this means now is um, we return, if we have a temporary object like this, and we call get value, we copy the value. So we, we return by value, that's safe. Now, if the temporary object is gone, the return value is still a valid string. If we don't have this, in the general case, let's return as a const reference. So let's implement this. Uh, let's compile this. And run. Well, this is valid now. And yeah, this could be an accident, but I can promise you now this is not an accident. That is because we have fixed our getters. So, and the performance of the sorting is still good because here now, if we call get value, we have an object with a name. A named object is what, or what we call an L value will not fall under this get value overload. It will fall under this get value overload and just return a reference to the value. So we have made this fast by saying when we can, then the getter returns the value by reference. But if it's important to be safe because we use a temporary object that might die before you use the value. So like here, um, let's here have the implementation for that case and um, use two ampersand and return by value. So we are both safe and fast. Not sure how many people knew this feature already. It's called reference uh, overloading on reference qualifiers. And um, we can improve it a little bit also because you are calling here get value for a temporary object or an object that's marked with move. So it's an object that's about to die. So we no longer need the value in the object. So what we can use here, std move. So we can move out the value, which means the following will happen. If we call new mail here, we create a temporary email object with a value. And when we then call get value, it's a temporary object. So this implementation will be called. We move out the value and give it back to the caller. So we don't have to create a copy. We just um, move this up value out. So the temporary object just right before it gets destroyed um, will no longer have this value. It will be moved away. And that's now both. We have good performance and we are safe. So if you have something like this, a getter to access expensive members, you can overload it that way so that you have safety when it's important 
and speed performance um, if it's possible. So let's compile this version again. And you see here now the numbers. Um, not sure whether the move here has an impact on our example. Um, probably not. Um, so I'll, I would have to use this a couple of times to see that this move still improves something. OK. Let's see. So we have some, can in this, by some warnings or absent, in this case of dangling reference be caught by some warnings or absent? Yes. Um, there are ways to detect problems like this. There are ways to see um, that we have a problem in this version. Um, uh, but um, we need um, we need to, um, to we need special support in the in the libraries for that, um, and we have to do something like marking that. If I call get value, the lifetime of the return value depends on the on the lifetime of the object I called get value for, because if you return by reference, it does not necessarily mean that you return. Um, by a, a reference to a member. It might also be a reference to a static object or so on. Then it's returned by reference is totally fine. So returning by reference in itself is not a problem. It is if this reference refers to the object we, we call this member function for. There are ways to instruct compilers in a way that you can detect this. Um, look, please look at the lifetime extension and Herb Sutter in the internet. And you can enable this feature for at least the standard classes to de detect some problems. Why are we on GCC 5.3? Um, because we can. I don't know. If you, if you want to have the same with, um, I don't know, GCC 9.2, we have roughly the same um, examples and pretty much the same numbers. So it's just because. Um, I have different compilers here. OK, so I hope this is answered. I hope this is answered. If I have time at the end, I might send around the link for the tool. Um, when the get value and version will follow copy elision, so it this will become faster than the reference one? Maybe, maybe not. You have to um, measure. You always have to measure. That's why I wanted to provide this example with real numbers. Um, so it's not a proof that this is always better. And especially, um, I saw that without minus O2, that move operations become very slow. So um, at least if you have some move operations, um, turn on minus O, but minus O2. Um, but the best thing is measure. But you see the point here in general beside optimization the compilers can do. So let's look at another location we can improve. So we have improved significantly the sorting. Can we also improve the initialization? Yes, we can. Look at this declaration. I can improve this declaration. I can do the following. I can take the object by value and move this in. Let's measure. It's a little bit better now. Um, it's, um, yeah, a little bit. I, I saw some examples where this is significant better. So again, this depends on optimization of your code. Um, let's see what we do here. Let me double check that I see the right slides.
So remember um, that we had um, a first version. Well, let me first show you that again, where we said, let's initialize a class object here with two string members. Let's take the argument by reference and copy, which means that we first have to create this temporary strings f and l, and then we use them to initialize the first members or the members first and last. And that was a copy because um, this here are objects f and l. These are l values. Even if you use move here, that would not help because um, these are constant objects. So a move on a constant object has not uh, any effect. So you will have the effect that you first create a temporary string and then you copy this string into the customer you just create before you push it back into the vector. Now, what we do here is if I say, well, let's instead take the argument by value and move, um, what, what happens then instead? Well, to create our customer, we first, again, have to create F and L, the parameters. So we create the strings, but um, they are not cons. So move has an effect. And if we call move on them, this will move the allocated memory of these two um, strings into the members of the customer. And then, as you learned already, the default generated move constructor will move them then into the vector. So that's another improvement we can have. Now, you might say, again, um, did you measure? Where is it? Uh, can't it be optimized away by compilers? Yes, you're right. Always measure. But I give you some numbers. Um, so here I, I show you some numbers I had when I measured this on different platforms. I'm, I took a general use case. Let's create a customer initialized by two string literals, then a customer by one string, existing string and a string literal, and then a customer by a string we no longer need. So we mark it with move and a string literal. Ideally, this should have five memory allocations. Each time we pass a string literal, one, and here this S has to be copied. So if we implement our constructors the common way we learn, so a customer taking a const string reference, classic L value reference, and then copying it into the members, we have 10 memory allocations. Four times we create a string, Six times we copy a string. If I take the arguments by value and move, we have only five memory allocations. So the number of memory allocations um, is um, ideal already. But we have a couple of moves, seven moves. And if moves are expensive, um, that might take even more time. Um, so what are the alternatives? The alternatives are you overload the constructors for all the different cases you have. So you say, OK, let's take a string we still need. So I take it as a const L value reference and copy it. Um, and the other implementation is I get a string where I can steal the value from. So I use move semantics. So I get a string as an R value reference and move it into the member. So both strings are still needed. That's my implementation. Both strings are no longer needed. So I can move them in. And of course, we need all the combinations. So first string is uh, still needed. Last string is no longer needed. And the other way around. So I would have four implementations, four constructors. Still, I would have four memory, uh, five memory allocations. But I would save two moves. The reason we have a couple of moves is that we pass a lot of time just string records. So maybe the best version is this. You implement um, constructors for all these cases, avoiding any, uh, any internal uh, creation of a temporary object. 
And so you add constructors taking a string literal, so a character pointer, and of course, all the combinations. So you have to implement nine constructors here. And that's, yeah, that's good. That's five memory allocations. Four times you create a string, one times you copy it, and you have only one move in this example. Um, yeah, we have a move because here in this case, we pass a string, you should move. So again, the question is, which one is better? And how significant is the benefit? Because I think we, we all agree, um, just implementing a constructor in one line is easier to maintain than implementing um, nine different um, functions to initialize a customer. So let's measure. Um, I did this measurement for this example with some add-ons. And in a couple of loops, not just this trivial example as we have here. So we have this four approaches. Here are the numbers. On three different platforms, I don't know, Wendbox was there. Um, my personal platform with Windows and with GCC. Um, you see a point here. You see that the classic approach having 10 memory allocations is significantly longer, slower than the others. But the difference between the other implementation is, well, there's a little bit improvement, like here on this platform from 2.7 to 2.3. Um, what's that ever that is, um, milliseconds or so in average for a couple of initializations. So um, is it worth it to have all these uh, nine constructors implemented, or is one enough? But I think it's clear that the, the constructor taken by value and move is significant better. Now you might say, wait a minute, what happens with if move if is expensive? So for that, I did the same and added an array of 100 coordinates. And a coordinate is a three-dimensional uh, double value, so x, y, and z value. So we have something like 300 um, double values here. We also have to move uh, or copy in this case because uh, we are in an array, but, well, but it's double value, so there's not nothing to optimize with uh, move semantics. So we still have to copy the bytes. And you see that the factor uh, is not that well anymore, but the difference is roughly the same. So here we save three, and here we also save three, well, 2.5, something like that. So it seems the overhead, we still save the overhead for the strings, that we don't copy the strings anymore. But comparing it with the overhead of other things we do, the factor is not so well anymore. So with this numbers, again, I want to I wanted just give you that you have an option now to implement your classes differently. So let's go back to this and see, yes, you can. If you have expensive members to initialize, like a string, you can now, in, with move semantic, instead of taking the value by reference and copy, take it by value and move. Is it, does it mean you should now always take by value and move? No. That's only useful if you create something new, or what we say, if you adopt the value, if you take the ownership of a value. So we create a new value here. For example, you should never implement setters that way. A setter taken by value and move will, will, counter, will be counterproductive because you already have allocated memory. And ideally, the setter will not need any more memory um, at all. So, But here, we definitely need some memory for this new string value. So let's create it here already and then move this memory around. That might be cheaper than copying it twice. OK, let's see. I think I had this done. Uh, I think this I had answered. What are your thoughts on returning an R value reference from get value ampersand? Well, an R value reference is a reference. 
the problem we solve is that we have dangling references. So I don't think this will solve the issue. OK. Let's see. Let's look at my time frame. I have um, well, half, half of the code is done, but we have more to do. So where are we? We have. Well, we have now pretty good numbers. Um, but now let's talk about some other aspects of move semantics. And we're, we're using a couple of features um, that are just created on the fly with move semantics, like move constructors. But we also have used move semantics to support this class even more in the initialization of objects and in the getters. So what else can we do? Well, there's a typical thing you might want to do in this case. And uh, that is you want to make sure, and that's, a, that's one of the benefits of encapsulation of data. You want to make sure that each email address has an ampersand inside or has a well is a well formed string so the easiest way we can do is let's check whether we have an ampersand so maybe we do it as a as an as a runtime error so when we have no ampersand uh, we have an assertion which is disabled when we are in release mode so because our test suites cover all the cases maybe that's too dangerous but that's a different decision so let's um, introduce an assertion saying, um, if the value we have um, is a problem, um, well, let's um, find an ampersand. Let's try to find an ampersand. And if we can't find that ampersand, so let me say it, um, that we, um, Say that's not equal. Um, oh, no. Yeah, we assert that this is not equal so that we can find something that this is not equal std string and cross. So that way, we would say, um, I don't accept email addresses that do not have an ampersand. So let's let's test this behavior. Oh, um, by the way, um, there's a there's a question asking um, bef before the in, in the previous problem. Does the string view help here? No, it does not. It's even worse because if you pass a string, then a string view will only be a pointer to that string, and you will create a string again. Never use a string view in a chain of values where at the end you need a string. Um, start with a string and then move it around. That's the better answer. So don't use string views here. No, they are counterproductive. Use only string views if you just want to have read access, but don't want to adopt the value. Good. So um, we come back. We want to assert, we want to make sure that this email address um, does never have an ampersand. And so far, if I implement a class like that, and even without the moves, I would assume we are safe. Here, there's no way that an email can have an ampersand inside. So let's um, test this. Email um, E1 is initialized with the empty string. That should fail. Email E2 is initialized with um, Nico Yusutis. That should fail. Email E3 is initialized with, I don't know, 
uh, nico at com. That should work fine. So let's see. Oh, a cert needs a header file. That's a C macro. And that's why we also need no STD in front of the cert. So that's declared. And, um, oh, that's wrong. I don't need it here. I need it um, here. So in my class, I have the assertion. So I don't need it here. Let me save both versions. And let me compile, and it should work now. Yep. OK, so we have um, we have a call down because the assertion fails here. The assertion is broken here, and that is caused by these two things. So let's um, disable them, one of them. Still have the assertion. Let's um, disable both. Works fine. Okay. So why do I bring this topic up? We have to talk about something that can happen if you have Move semantics. Move semantics can break invariance. So what we really have here, we have here an invariant, which means we have something we assume is true for each and every object we have um, of this class. So invariant um, there is always an ampersand. <clears throat> and um, Code like code might work on this and and and, pro and benefit from that. Um, this invariant might now be broken because let's look at the following example. Um, let's create an email address. Just e and initialize it with the moved value from collection zero. So we move the first element in this, ve in this vector, we move it to an email address. The point is, the default move constructor, which is used here, will move away the value. Our first vector will no longer have a value. Well, strictly speaking, the standard says um, the string of the moved from object is in a valid but unspecified state. That means it might have any value. It's still a valid object but it might have any value at all. You don't know what the value is. Typical implementations create um, an empty string there, but that's not guaranteed. Don't forget that. So in this case, um, you might say, yeah, sure. I should no longer use this element. Of course, I should not do that. Um, well, but things sometimes happen accidentally. So let's assume we have something like this. Let's assume we have um, a value called std string get domain const 
And this returns um, the domain part of this email address, including the ampersand. So something like that. Well, we could say this is returns of the value, there's a substring um, where the ampersand starts. Value dot find. And um, let's see here. So let's return the value, a new temporary object. And this temporary object um, starts where we can find the ampersand. This class looks fine. And without having these special move handlings, um, th this might be a valid C++03 class. In C++03, you can not have a situation that you have a move from state. So whenever we copy an email address, it will also have an ampersand. So this code is safe in C++03. But it's broken with C++11 because this might return NPOS. So we can't find the ampersand anymore if the object, the value of the object was moved away, if we have a moved from object. And if you then call substring, you are in trouble, or you have undefined behavior, or um, which might or might not work depending on what exactly do you do. So now let's um, iterate over this um, collection and say, let's have a const auto reference um, email, and let's iterate over the collection of all the elements. I forgot that I moved away this um, the value of the email address and said, oh, let's print out or let's check if um, E is um, not equal, excuse me, if E dot, um, get domain is not equal um, at, what is it? All my email addresses have mydomain.com. So if it's not mydomain.com, let's print out we have another domain. Other domain. E dot get domain. Yes, you can improve this code a little bit, but you see the point. I iterate over all these elements. I assume that um, get domain is safe. Get the implementer of get domain thought that it is safe because there's always an ampersand inside, but that was broken. And the effect is a quarter. Oh, no, not a quarter. In this case, an out of range exception. Depending a little bit how the implementers of this library react on this problem. And uh, because we run into undefined behavior. So, um, let's see. Um, I think you see the problem. The problem is that for a moved from object, we create a state where the invariant that we always have an ampersand is broken. Um, and the reason is the generated move constructor of this class. Same for the move assignment operator. So while it is good that move semantics is automatically generated for your types, it can create states you haven't seen before or you have not expected before, especially if it's an old class from 03. Um, we were aware of that. Uh, we took the risk because you need a, some, some special behavior to see that. But there is a danger, yes. And it was a well discussion when we standardized C++11 whether we wanted to generate move operations at all automatically. So the current rules, as you probably know, are 
um, they are automatically generated if there is no other special member function. But uh, as you can see, this is a price. You might break invariance. So how do we fix this problem? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, OK. Um, there's one way to fix this problem. <laughs> we could say, let's disable this. Let's disable move semantics. Disable move semantics for this type at all. I would get a little bit interesting. How do we disable move semantics in a type? You might say, wait a minute, email. I simply type that I have deleted the um, move constructor and that you have deleted the move assignment operator. Yeah, that way we no longer have the move operations. Let's compile. Oops. I get, I, I think I get some problems. A lot of problems. Well, some are problems. Yeah, like this. This declaration does no longer work. You have marked the object with move, but you have disabled move. Now, the important thing is here, normally, if I don't have move semantics implemented at all, um, there's a fallback mechanism. So when move is not supported, copying will be used, and copy constructors um, might still be there. But we have a couple of rules to, to learn. The first thing is, if you declare moving operations, special move member functions, you have disabled copying. But fix that this does disable copying. So you have enabled them to enable them also. The default implementation works fine. It just comp comp uh, copies the member. So um, let's use here default and recompile. Oh, it doesn't look a lot better. So what's wrong now? Use of a deleted function. We still, the compiler still complains about this. And the reason is, if you explicitly delete the move operations, you have no longer the fallback mechanism that is, if move is not supported, copying will be used. You have disabled all calls where the use of move semantics might be possible. And that's different from you have disabled move semantics and still can use the fallback mechanism. So the funny thing is, what you have to do is you have you can't declare the move the so special move member functions. Don't declare them with default because the implementation is not what you like, and don't declare them with delete. Um, just make sure that they are not generated. And uh, that way, you just declare some other special member functions, like a destructor, as we have seen at the beginning of the talk. Or the common way is to do that. So disable generated 
move semantics and you could probably comment that um, so that people understand that because no, don't delete move members. That will not, that will be too, delete too much. So that way now we have implemented a class that has copy semantics and uh, So we have now um, the get domain problem we have no longer because now, because we only have copy semantics, um, we have, um, yeah, this code is, is now valid again. That's probably not a good solution. So option A is disable moves, generated move semantics to do that. Um, you have to default other special member functions. That's, by the way, a break of what we usually know as a rule of five. The rule of five usually says that we have, um, if you declare one of the special member functions, declare them all. But here in this case, you can't declare the move members um, unless you implement them. And if you implement them, you have to implement them that they behave like a copy constructor. So I think it's even possible that a move constructor calls a copy constructor, but I would not say that this is in any way same code. So um, be careful with the rule of five. The rule of five saying if you declare one of the five special member functions, declare them all, that's not exactly correct. And if you read details, about the core guidelines, um, they will state, no, think about very carefully when you implement a special member function about the others. And implementing them might be even counterproductive as you have seen here. So disable move semantics, well, default copy semantics. That's the rule. But the other option is let's fix. Let's fix the move operator. So different ways to fix this. The question is, what is the state if my email address was moved away? And um, I should say something here. The problem you see here with a broken invariance and moved from objects is only a problem if you use std move. If you have temporary objects, there's no problem because temporary objects anyway, after they the value was moved away, are destroyed. But here, you can use them still. And that means um, you might use objects that are in a state you don't expect to have. And um, so we have to think about what is the state of a move from object here. And that's also a semantic th thing to discuss. I mean, we want to have optimizations like move semantics here. But then we have to decide what is a valid state for this object so that everything works fine with the API I implemented here for this email class. So my decision might be the following. Um, let's implement a new um, Boolean value from where I can say this is uh, by default false. So the value was not moved away. And let's use this so that we can um, use it in other places where people might call things they should not call. So we might say here now, let's add an assertion um, that this is not moved from, so that this value was not moved away. And now we have to implement the um, use option B, um, um, fix move operations. So let's implement them. Um, email created from an email where I no longer need the value. Um, 
So what this means is I have two members. Let me raise this a little bit. I have value and moved from. So the value is initialized with the value from E. But uh, we have move semantics. Move semantics is not passed through. We have to, although the caller does not need the value of the email address anymore, we have to say when we here no longer need the value anymore. And the moved from value is also copied. So the new object has a former state of the old of the object we create this new object from. Oh, excuse me. No, this is moved from. So, but we do something else. We say moved from, excuse me, e dot moved from is true. So this object has a moved from value, which means we can check this now, like here, um, get domain, um, have this assertion. Uh, of course, there are other ways possible. You could we could say if the value was moved for, away from get domain returns an empty string. It depends, as I said, semantically what the right reaction is, and you have to think about that because that, that is a new state you haven't seen before without move semantics. And the same way we have to implement the assignment op uh, move assignment operator. So email operator equal taking an email address we no longer need. Excuse me, that's wrong. So, um, and that means um, value equals acidity move of e dot value. So we no longer need the value in e, we move it to the object where we assign the value to and moved from equals e dot moved from. So in case we assign a value that was is a, has a moved from value already, we assign this to an object that then also still is marked moved from. And e dot moved from is true. So here we, here's a fix. Everything else is as a generated functions are. But the fix is that we, in addition, when we call a move constructor or move assignment operator, the object where we are moved from the value, we mark it that the value was moved away. And we can use that in other places like here. And probably I should also say that maybe here in the getter, in both getters. Let's compile. I have a problem. Oh, I missed something. Now, if I'm in a classroom, you probably saw that already. Um, moved from, yeah. Well, first of all, I prefer curly braces here now. So there was one brace too much. Oh, now here is one missing. So initialize the value with the move from value from E and um, move value from E and move from just copy the values. Um, it's just a Boolean value. There's nothing move semantic can help us. Oh, a return statement is missing, of course. Return star this. That's it. Email test. Email test. Okay, we have fixed the broken invariant, but look at the numbers. They not don't look very well. So what is the problem? The problem is that in vectors, we have disabled reallocation using move semantics. 
And that is something that the last topic we have to fix in this class. The last topic we have to fix in this class, let me come up with the corresponding slide. In um, C++03, we guaranteed that if you have a vector and you call pushback, that if an exception thrills, you, we can roll back the vector for you. So you can still use the vector having its own state. So pushback is kind of transactional. So if your vector has here um, five elements, five email addresses, A, B, C, D, E, um, we allocate new memory, we did copy the elements, and if in this case something went wrong and an exception was thrown, which means an exception was thrown in the copy constructor, we could just roll back by saying, let's delete everything we created new and we still have the vector in its old state. That's what we call the, um, the strong exception guarantee. Now, we wanted to have that, also with move semantics. So with move semantics, yeah, we, we, we allocate new memory for a vector, here's the old vector, and then now let's, instead of copying the elements, let's move them. And it turned out that if we move them and the move operation might throw on, an, um, on the move operation, um, we are in trouble because we have already modified the old element in the old memory. Now you might say we can move back, but who says that moving back is safe and works? So as a result of this, and there was a long discussion about this, as a result, we have the following behavior. If you have a customer, or here's a customer, but if you have an email address, something with a string, and you have implemented a move constructor, and you call pushback, and your memory is not enough, all the elements are still copied because that way we can guarantee to roll back if there is an exception. But if the move constructor guarantees not to throw, um, we will use move semantic here because then we don't uh, have a problem with the guarantee that if the exception goes, we can't roll back. Um, there can't be an exception. so. There's no need to roll back, we know that. So that's a behavior of the vector. And that is what is missing in our implementation now. We have implemented here a move constructor, and all we need is we have to say, this does not throw. And let's recompile. So let me uh, come up with the other windows. So did I save it? Let's recompile. And this is faster now again. This is the first call. Yeah, that's a little bit better. So we have move semantic now again when the vector has to allocate new memory. So I'm close to the end of the time. So therefore, um, let me summarize what we have seen here. First, you have seen your types automatically provide move semantics. Move semantics is automatically supported if you have no special member functions. If you have special member functions, we don't uh, generate it because we don't know how, and it might be broken. The default generated move semantics might be broken by the semantics you have when copying elements. For expensive members, it might be helpful to take the members by value and move instead of taking them by reference and copy. And you might overload getters for, um, R value references, so for temporary objects, uh, objects without a name, and other objects, so that sometimes you return by value, sometimes by uh, reference. 
And then we have moved from objects. They have um, they should not break invariance. Um, some people say they have to be partially formed. I have to fix that. That slide is not correct. I have to fix that afterwards. Um, destructors have to work. Assignment have to work. So the the C++ standard um, requires a couple of things about your types. The rough general rule is that in the C++ standard, we require that a moved from object is nothing special. So a moved from object should also support all the requirements for other objects of your type. Think about sort. To sort objects, you have to support the less than operator. We expect that you can also call the less than operator for a moved from object. And that reason we say, OK, um, um, we have no special guarantees for move from objects. They should just give all the guarantees normal objects do. And that's the way you should implement them in your code. So um, if I have a less than operator for my email address, I should make sure that less than is still callable for um, even if the state is uh, moved from. Um, because for implementation reasons, sort might call less than for moved from object, although it was moved away to somewhere else. Um, some people claim that this is too much. So, uh, we, we could avoid calling less than for objects that were moved away to a different location, but so far the guarantee in the standard is like that. And then at the end, if you want to disable move semantic, um, you have to um, you have to um, default copy semantics, but if and if you want to implement move semantics, don't forget to think about no except. That's all. It was an experiment. Some implementations. I don't tell you how much went wrong in this <laughs> experiment, but um, that's it. That's my keynote, and I hope you learned a couple of things. Um, and we can have final questions now. And let me say something here. If you are interested in, in this uh, Thanks, group, uh, Nico. yeah, just one word. Um, there's a special yes. prize available for the next 10 days for the, this book about Move Semantics. It's not done yet. It's a draft ebook, but you will get all updates for free. Thank Great. you. Great. Thanks. We can help you taking some questions now, I think. If you want, I don't know, if you want to start from your slide or. Oh, yeah, there uh, were some, some, some open questions still. Is there a way to track and count the mallocs? Um, well, yeah, I mean, debuggers might do that. Um, um, I, the, the way you can implement that yourself is you have to implement the global operator new and delete. and then count how many memory allocations are there. It's not a big deal, and it's just a hack to see some, some points. Um, those who asked for that, um, send me an email, and I can point you to some example code for that, especially with inline static member functions in C17. That's easy now to provide as a, as a header file. Um, what a, about template constructor and forward. If you implement a template constructor and forward, you are in huge trouble because um, templified function members might bind better than a copy or move constructor. So if you do that, make sure that your templified constructor does not get higher priority than a copy and move constructor. And to do that, you need tricks like you might have heard, like enable if, or uh, since C20, we have requires for that. So be careful with that one. Um, what else? What if the I think we don't oh, we don't have yeah. any on YouTube. If you if you if everyone if anyone from the audience have any questions, please drop it on the slider or on YouTube. So we can uh, we can take them. Is it okay that the move assignment returns by copy? Oh, did I implement that? That's 
that's not what the move assignment do. The move assignment by default um, returns by reference. Um, well, did I implement it that way? My goodness. Um, let's see. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's not correct. Thank you very much. It should be that way. <laughs> good, good catch. Good catch. Um, what if the call vector would be a vector of unique email? Well, unique pointer email means um, we have only one element at a time, but we run in, into the same problem that um, for, for unique pointers, move semantics means that ownership is moved to another location. So if you then use a moved from object that has a unique pointer inside, um, you should not access this member. So it's, it, it's sometimes like moved from is implicitly enabled. So before you access the member, you have to ask, is this unique pointer still valid? So you run exactly in the same problem um, or a similar problem if you have a unique pointer of string inside or if you have a unique pointer of email, um, yeah, uh, the value will be moved away. Um, you have to check for that. What about a builder with a fluent API where each call returns star this? So this, I don't understand this question. Do you understand, somebody? Is it on the slider? Yeah, the top question there. Let me have a look. So maybe I take the next what, one. Um, what about the, the next one is: Should we make the move assignment assignment operator check for self assignment? Um, yes, if it's necessary, please do so. The standard does not do that, as it does not guarantee you to do that for the copy assignment. Um, but if it's a problem, so if if it can happen, then you move your your own value away from yourself. And if this is a problem, you should implement that. It's not always necessary. So because they're here, if we move away the value from ourselves to the other value, and, and both value members are the same members, you just have moved the value from the object to itself. So it's usually only necessary where you do something like, um, let's um, free memory and then assign memory from somewhere else, so then you're in trouble. So in general, you can do that. It's not always necessary to do that. And at the same, with the same rules as a, as a copy assignment. Good. And um, Nico, someone is asking, on? sorry for in, to interrupt. Someone mm -hmm. is asking what's the link for the new book? I think it's cppmove.com, right? cppmove.com is a website. Okay. If okay. you want to have a discount, if not, I'm fine. I do this for a living. <laughs> but if you want to have the discount, um, itcppcon at, put at the end and you get a, a small discount. Maybe we can send it around in the YouTube yeah. chat also, also. Yeah, yeah, I did it. Okay, thank you very much. So, any other questions? I don't know how much time we have left. I think I'm I'm over time already yeah, a little bit. I, but I think you you took many many questions. I don't see any others on on the chat. Th thanks again, Nico, for uh, for this great session for joining us. I don't know if you can stay a bit on on the Discord server in case. You can follow up conversations there. Uh, I first have to log in into the Discord yeah. server to find that out. Um, I will do my uh, my very best. <laughs> thanks. Sorry. I I have just a few a few things to say before yeah. we, we we take a break for uh, fifteen minutes. So we we restart at uh, uh, eleven twenty. We have two tracks now, so you have to you have to choose. But don't worry because everything will be on uh, on YouTube. So if you if you miss one talk, you can you can watch the other one uh, tomorrow, maybe or when you like. Another another tip to to say is uh, you can use this time to join Discord if you like. So if you have the check-in link, uh, you do check-in and then you get access to the lobby page. Uh, at the very beginning of the lobby page you'll see the invitation to Discord. But if you have any troubles, send, a, send an email, no, no worries. Another clarification I want to make, and then we go for the break, 
Uh, Timur asked a great question on Discord. He spotted that the time of the conference on the website is until 6 p.m., but the talks end at 4 p.m. So, uh, what, what is who is right? So, actually, they are both right because the talks are uh, ending at 4, let's say, 4, mm, 4 10, more or less. But at four, the, the talks end, end at four. Uh, the idea is to uh, keep the Discord server alive for the whole day. So we actually put six uh, as an indication because usually our events uh, end up 6 p.m. But the server will be up uh, until tonight, I think. So if you want to, to follow up conversation, in particular with people that are on the other side of the world that maybe nowadays are sleeping, like for example, I think Walter and Connor, they are sleeping at the moment, but they can follow up conversation on Discord uh, afterwards. So they are both right. Talks 4 p.m. and the, the rest of the networking is until the end of the day. So I get off the stage. Thanks again, Nico. Um, Thank you very much. Now we split into a couple of tracks and we'll see. So let's see uh, in uh, 15 minutes, uh, 11.20. Thank, thank you all for joining this uh, uh, C++ event.